Look at this. I never knew it was so much African American history, huh? Right? I didn't either. The story of African Americans in our city is long and proud. I'm Michelle Williams. Our migration to Rockford, Illinois began in 1834, when Lewis Lemon traveled from Galena, Illinois, with his owner, Germanicus Kent. I think one of the greatest things this city has is the statue of Germanicus Kent, Thatcher Blake, and Lewis Lemon. Uh, I don't know if people, students especially, know the significance of that. But Lewis Lemon, who the school was named for, uh, was the first African American to live in Rockford. Uh, Germanicus Kent bought him from a slave owner in the South for $450. After the turn of the century, the African American community increased. They came from many places within the United States. In 1912, Henry Temple Watts and his family boarded a train headed for Rock Island because he heard there were many jobs there. His grandson said, My grandfather thought he heard the conductor say Rock Island, so he got off the train by mistake in Rockford. The story goes that Henry said, This looks like a nice place, so they stayed. Because of Henry's good business sense and his desire to build a good life for himself and his family, he started a window washing service. His grandson explained, my grandfather also cleaned the store's lanterns, too. The lanterns in those days had brass casings. To make certain the lanterns were polished well, Henry invented a brass polish. My grandfather's polish was used in many factories. I still have the original formula for his polish. The Army's 389th Colored Regiment was stationed right here at Camp Grant during World War II. After the war, many African Americans remained behind in the Rockford community. A lot of African Americans left the South, coming to the North, uh, seeking better jobs, better pay, and to escape the Jim Crow laws. In 1946, many African Americans began migrating North looking for better jobs, better pay, and less Jim Crow laws. The Double V campaign encouraged African Americans to demand justice at home throughout the United States. The challenges that African Americans faced in Rockford uh, throughout uh, the city's history uh, were somewhat typical of communities this size uh, in the North. It was a, perhaps a welcome departure for African Americans who had come from the South, but uh, it was not exactly a picnic. There was job discrimination, there was housing discrimination. In the early 50s, many foundries like J.I. Case and Gunnite began to hire more African Americans. On January 6, 1951, the black newspaper The Crusader reported, Gunnite invites graduates of Tuskegee Institute to come to Rockford for jobs. The Tuskegee Institute of Alabama, headed by Booker T. Washington in 1881, is an Ivy League college for African American students. The migration north continued, and the African-American community in Rockford began to grow. Well, Jesus, you know, if you're they established places of worship. Peter Blakely, a Methodist, called together a group of people to establish the first African-American house of worship in 1891. Glenda Hildreth, a member of Allen Chapel since 1968, said, Besides being the first place of worship for African Americans, it also serves as a place of fellowship. Our church has been a driving force in the lives of African Americans who become prominent citizens in our community. Robert Brown and Eugene Caldwell have both served at Allen Chapel for about 80 years. One of Allen Chapel's most important projects is the promotion of education. As a result, a very large number of African-American teachers work and serve at this church. Allen Chapel's Wade Harris Soup Kitchen supported and fed many needy families within the community. The church has grown and expanded to its new location. Other African-American churches have contributed to the community as well. As you know, the church does have a positive impact on the community. We intend to even do better in our impact on the community in a positive way. 
One of those churches is the Pilgrim Baptist Church, which was founded on August 6, 1917. The pastor was Rev. T.P. McGee. Pilgrim prided itself on the tradition that education and prayer are the first steps to life. Still got joy. After the Depression in 1935, Still Reverend Woods and the Pilgrim joy. Gospel Chorus started broadcasting on WROK of Rockford. In 1944, Reverend Eldridge Gilbert Sr. became pastor of Pilgrim. The well-educated Gilbert encouraged the education of his congregation. Education being a priority at Pilgrim, they decided to provide scholarships to its college-bound students. Over the 44-year period, I would say that he had uh, three focus areas. He always, uh, his theme was a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, an ever-dying soul to save and fitted for the sky. And then with regard to the focus on education, um, during the 44 years, he influenced well over 250 youngsters to go to college, and uh, we know that, it, that over that 44-year period, uh, a significant number of them graduated from college and went on to enjoy um, professional careers. Many of them uh, went on to, for graduate training and became uh, professionals in the area of law and medicine and so forth. African Americans had other social outlets as well. In 1957, the El Dorado Club, owned by Archie Papa Hawks, became the mecca of Rockford's African American community. The club served the best steak sandwich in town. My father came here in the 1930s, and uh, later on, in, we, he was always a, worked on the railroad uh, cooking, and he opened up the El Dorado Club. The El Dorado Club was known all over town. Everybody from all races and creeds and education come to the El Dorado and they like the Papa Hawk steak sandwich. That's what we're known for. They also was known for the jam session that we had upstairs. And uh, we was there for years and we got to make a lot of friends in this town. Archie's son, Lloyd, said, everyone came to the El Dorado Club. Judges, lawyers, doctors, politicians, you name it, they came. People walk up to me today and associate me with our steak sandwich. Earlier, in 1951, the Tuxedo Club, owned by several African-American men, thanked the community and the Crusaders for their support. But the biggest social place was the Booker Washington Center, which was initially formed to welcome the colored soldiers stationed at Camp Grant. At that time, the center was called the Colored Soldiers Club. The club opened in 1916 at 218 South Main Street by Dr. Richard S. Grant. The way it started, was a USO, uh, Camp Grant, had the black soldiers here and they couldn't, they couldn't mingle, they couldn't go into USO down in town. They couldn't mix up. So uh, uh, I think it was Dr. Fonderville and somebody else started a USO uh, down on South Main Street. Then after they moved it up on Kent Street, they turned it into the Book Washington Center. Since that time, they realized there was a need to promote civic, educational, cultural, and recreational activities for the community. Many children and families have been served there. Booker T. Washington Center was another one of my uh, favorite places we go. And uh, I met my wife there, and we've been married uh, 56 years. I met her there on a hayride. Uh, Oscar Blackwell was pulling the, with his father's tractor, was pulling the, the wagon. Some of the small churches that started, started in the Booker Washington Center. They'd come there and have their church service till they grew old and was able to get their own facility. They did that in Booker Washington Center. Book Washington Center was a place where, you know, like uh, if the people wanted, uh, uh, like they used to be, it was relief back then, but now it's, what do they call it, the card they get for food? Well, they used to go there to get that and stuff, like that, all kind of stuff. So it was a main place in Rockford for the black community to go and to get stuff like that. African Americans have used Booker as a place to learn. Our young ladies learned how to set a table. To lead, our young men formed planning committees and played basketball. The midgets groomed at the Booker Washington Center have made excellent achievements in life. I got the organization we started called Friends of Booker. And we started that because we, some, it was an article in the paper they wanted to tear the Booker Washington Center down and make it a parking lot for Tinker's Cottage, which Tinker's Cottage is history. But Booker Washington Center is history also. And it kind of works out. We started this organization, Friends of Booker. 
that's what we wanted to build it back up because the gym burned down and they didn't get it back for some reason. And so we wanted to try to build it back. But a lot of good people. We had a lot of uh, uh, directors come out there that did good things for our kids there. They had the championship basketball team with West High School. At least four or five of those players come out of the Book Washington Center had played together since they was a midgets. Nolan Gentry, Bobby Washington, Slaughter, uh, Bedford, and they went on to win the championship at West High School. So we're proud of that. A lot of, lot of good basketball. Earl Drake, Bobby, uh, Bobby, Bobby Bowden, a lot of good players come out of there. So that's, that's close to my heart. We had a lot of fun up there. We used to leave West High School in the afternoon, head right for Book Washington Center to get on the basketball court. Mr. Marshall Stark said, BWC has served as an important mainstay for our community. Many great leaders have come from this center. Elliot Shredwell, a nuclear physicist, and Nolan Gentry, a politician in Iowa, were midgets at Booker Washington in the day. These are just a few who have went on to lead in our community. As the African American community grew, conflicts and struggles within the community were abound. Major housing restrictions prevented African Americans from living where they wanted. In the 40s, as uh, large numbers of African Americans came to the Rockford community, um, there, there was no housing available for them. And so most of them were able to find housing in Southwest Rockford and indeed with the rigid uh, the rigidity that had set in with the refusal to sell housing to African Americans, they were left only to South Rockford primarily unless uh, they had lived in other areas, which they had for a good period of time. They knew to change their circumstances, more government representation was needed. Reverend Gilbert, minister activist, went about his way working with others to make a change for the Rockford African American community. Victory Homes um, is a, um, a monument to his uh, willingness and, and persistence to have persons included in all phases of life in Rockford and certainly to enhance the quality of life for African Americans. Um, I believe Victory Homes, the was uh, the project began in 1948 and some 20 uh, odd homes were built in an area on Island Avenue between Central and Rose Avenue. Those houses are yet existing today and they are occupied and uh, they were the first or one of the first areas in Rockford where African Americans were able to occupy brand new homes. Other African-American activists and politicians have followed in Gilbert's footsteps, serving and advocating for people in our community. One of the remarkable things that's happened in Rockford, of course, uh, in, in recent decades, was uh, the election of, a, of an African-American mayor, who, who uh, Charles Box, who was elected three times by enormous margins, especially the first two elections. That was in a community that had a population of only 15 percent blacks. So uh, I think that speaks well of the whole community. Charles Box, Rockford's first African-American mayor, served four terms. My name is Charles Box. I was mayor of the city of Rockford uh, from 1989 to 2001. Uh, prior to that time, I was a legal director for the city of Rockford for six years and city administrator for two years. I've been asked to talk today about the issue of politics and the role African-Americans have played in the political arenas here in uh, the state of Rockford and in Winnebago County. My starting point, I could say, would be the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, where, of course, uh, the longest serving um, gentleman in the elected arena has been Alderman Victory Bell. Uh, he's been on the city council for 35 plus years now. Uh, very aggressive, uh, very involved in minority issues. Um, for some time, he was the only uh, minority elected official, and uh, other minorities were elected to the county board, Henrietta Dodson Williams and others. Uh, and we've had other various individuals on the county board, Cy Simon, uh, and the latest, of course, Chuck Jefferson, uh, Dorothy Red, um, uh, a couple other individuals, you know, whose names escape me now, uh, George Ann Duckett and others. Uh, but on the city council, we, and we talk about progress, we talk about the one alderman in the late 60s and early 70s, we now have three African Americans, uh, Victory Bell, who's still serving. You have Ann Thompson, who served once before and now has been reelected again uh, for another term. Uh, you have Linda McNeely. Uh, who is also an alderman who's been there for quite some time now. 
So you have about 13 out of the 14 uh, aldermen in the city of Rockford who are elected officials, uh, African Americans, uh, doing what they can and what they think they can do uh, in their districts uh, and throughout the city of Rockford uh, for the city as a whole. Uh, things definitely have changed uh, over the last 30 years, obviously not enough for, for a lot of people and we all want more change. Uh, we'd like to see more uh, elect African American and Hispanic uh, elected officials to represent not only the interests of those parties but also the interests of the people where they live and the interests of the people in the entire city of Rockford. Uh, at the end of the day, that is, to me is the bottom line, doing what's best for the city if you're elected as a city official or the county as a county official. But you also, uh, you never forget your background, you never forget your upbringing, and you look at a problem from a different vantage point. Uh, when it comes to the judiciary, uh, last week we just had the first African American judge appointed, um, uh, Mr. Yarbrough, uh, I think it's a long time in coming. Uh, hopefully in the future you'll see more African American judges, not only as associate judges, but also circuit court judges. Um, in some, I think progress is being made. Uh, I think that more can be done, more should be done. Uh, but I think the future could be bright. Uh, we have a lot of bright young African Americans who are graduating not only uh, from the Rockford schools, but also coming back to this area. Uh, and for me, that is the key, to get people involved, to serve their community, not only as elected official that we've been talking about, but also in other capacities. Uh, we have the police department. You've got uh, Chief, um, Chief Glover. In the fire department, you've got a high-ranking, uh, Mr. Watkins is a high-ranking uh, official there. Uh, in the other departments, Jessica Jones is the uh, department head for uh, the personnel department. And you're seeing African-Americans head, head departments, not necessarily just human resources uh, or human services, as was uh, Gwen Robinson years ago. Uh, we're branching out into other fields, showing that uh, African-Americans, like every other uh, ethnic group in this country, have individuals, have the skills and the talents uh, to do the job that needs to be done in city and county government. A lot of times when people look at representation, they look at it from a, a factual or a numerical point of view. Uh, in the city of Rockford, we have three African-American uh, aldermen out of 14. That's roughly, tw I think, 22, 23 percent. And I, that's, I think that is probably the size of the African-American and Hispanic population in the city of Rockford. For, for, so from a numbers point of view, uh, the numbers are there. Uh, from a county point of view, uh, because the county is much wider and fewer African-Americans live outside the county, I think there are probably fewer percentage-wide um, out of the 28 uh, county board members. It's less than 20 percent, I would think, uh, that are African-Americans. In slavery, when African Americans were forbidden to read or write, the need for obtaining an education became very important to the African American community. Ms. Dolores Owens, a retired school teacher of District 205, said, My grandfather always told us to be free. You must have an education. The desire and emphasis to get an education made the people who care case more worth fighting for. When Judge Mahoney ruled in favor of the case, African Americans in the community breathed a sigh of relief. The People Who Care case was dissolved in June of 2002 after the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals found that the district had implemented most of the remedies that were required. As we sit here today in 2007, Rockford continues to grapple with some of the same issues that were found in the People Who Care case. Uh, including plans which would go back to neighborhood schools and although they result in, in segregation would also result in significant displacement of minority students. I do hope that the People Who Care case taught the community something about focusing on education with equity and fairness for all students. One of the things I hope we learn from the People Who Care lawsuit is that it is necessary for the community to continually focus on equity and fairness in education for all students. Here in Rockford, African Americans have always promoted education and an entrepreneur spirit, even from the beginning with Armstrong, Wilson, and Blakely. Many of the things that happened when I was mayor and the talks you would give and the subjects you would be asked to talk about, one was for our young people where I would, you would try to, along with the parents and others, encourage young people uh, to look down the road, look to the future, um, and to think about what they would like to be doing five, 10, 15 nine years down the road to dream. That was one of the basic things that I got from my parents was the, the idea of you can be whatever you want to be. Uh, as long as you're willing to put in the hard work and, and make the sacrifices that are needed. You have a lot of individuals here who are willing to help. Uh, and for our young people, we encourage them to look down the road, decide what they want to be, if it's a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, an engineer, uh, with the, in the computer science, but then find out what it takes to do that. The key is to not only dream, but also 
realize what it takes to make that dream come true and realize there are individuals who are willing to help and are able to help you uh, acknowledge and, and become uh, those professions that you want to become. But the key is, is to start now. And the key also is to think that the choices you make in your life today will have an impact on the things that you will be able to do. Because of their education, African Americans have become teachers, principals, engineers, doctors, dentists, attorneys, real estate agents, firefighters, and police officers. I worked on the Rockford Police Department for, for a total of 35 years, and with my educational background and my military background and my teaching background, I was able to move up in rank, and I subsequently went from all the way from patrol officer all the way to deputy police chief of administration, second in command as a matter of fact, at the Rockford Police Department under police chief uh, Bill Fitzpatrick. African Americans in our community have businesses like Downtown Shoes, owned by Dorothy Hill, who has been in business for 18 years, and Ubiquity, owned and operated by Sonny Crudup for 30 years. Several African Americans have published and distributed newspapers in our community. The Crusader ran from 1950 to 1972. It seems the same old problem occurs time after time. Even in the African American community in Rockford, Illinois, over 50 years ago, we still had the same problem, communication. Well, there were 10 men who felt that communication was really important for the black community, and the two newspapers that existed here in Rockford, Illinois, didn't provide the vehicle for communication. So they met for two years, led by Joe Saunders and Bernice Johnson, to plan a newspaper for Rockford, Illinois. And to quote Mr. Johnson, the black community needed to communicate, Johnson explained. They didn't necessarily need a mouthpiece, but they needed to communicate among themselves. So at that time, the Crusader was born. Along the ways others have ran, the Midwest Observer published by Mac Williams and founded by Margie Sturgis. Vital Force published by George Ann Duckett in the Black by Dorothy Hill, Minority Journal by Tamiko Stewart, and J. Bass, an inspirational newspaper published by Wilma Powell. C.A. Moore published Chrome Light, a magazine that featured different African Americans from Rockford. Estelle Black said, my cousin was featured in the Christmas edition. Moore's wife lives on the East Coast. After um, the Crusader, Bernie's, um, Mr. Moore, C.A. Moore, uh, who was a mortician here in Rockford, Illinois, decided that we needed to again communicate. So he established Chrome Light, which was uh, a magazine. And that was in June of 1962. It was bright, sharp, attractive, just what Mr. Moore wanted for the African American community in Rockford, Illinois. Joyce Thomas published the Black Pages, which promoted African American business owners and other community leaders. The African American community has many published authors, such as Kimberly Roby Lawson and Criola Cologne. African Americans have played a significant role in the Rockford community and have given other time and their talents to make the community a better place. Forrest Price is one of the premier people of the city. And we didn't really know that back then when we were growing up because he lived in our neighborhood. But we soon came to find out that he was a psychiatric social worker and that he formed his own business with uh, some partners on, uh, on Glenwood. And they were the, the Glenwood Avenue practice. And it was just amazing to us. And he was married to Marge, who was my fifth grade teacher. And again, we thought it was just amazing to have these people live in our neighborhood. Willie Bell, an activist and president of the NAACP Rockford chapter, has a great history in serving as a leader. Willie said, My uncle, Jasper Mims of Yazoo City, Mississippi, introduced me to the NAACP when I was 13 years old. As a young man, Willie served our nation in the armed forces, and as a community activist, Willie assisted in the integration of Rockford's police force. As a business leader, Willie opened Bell's Florist in 1960. 
Willie's principal beliefs are, we must live and obey God's guidelines. Education is significant. Willie has made his mark. Rebecca Cook Kendall, oh, one of the sweetest ladies I know, um, she is president of, of RAM, which is Rockford Area Minority Managers. She is one that every time I see her in the community, it's like everybody knows her, um, which is probably why she was uh, voted one of Rock River Valley's most influential people. I, I, I think she cares about people. She genuinely cares about people. She wants good things for African Americans, but she wants good things for all people. And I, I, I think that's, that's something that's uh, worth mentioning. I learned a lot about how African Americans shape this community. I love hearing those stories. 